and calendar and caucus. So anyway, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here, conferees, committee. Thank you for being here, staff. Thank you very much. Lance, do we have anybody on WebEx? Very good. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Uh, request for bill introductions. Representative Featherton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Linda Featherston, House District 16. I request introduction of 24 RS 3210. This bill is on behalf of my constituent, Christy, her children, Olivia, Samantha, Lucy, and Tyler. It requires cities of the first class and the counties in which they reside to have their law enforcement agencies develop a policy regarding vehicle pursuits by law enforcement. Committee objections. Seeing none, thank you. Bill thank is in. You. Committee further bill introductions. Committee, I have a bill introduction. The RS number is 3452. We will discuss this. We'll discuss this afterwards. There is a uh, document on your uh, deal here, KLRD. We're going to switch a little gears, go from Fed and State, Bailiwick, into a little bit of health care. And I'll explain that to you a little bit uh, later on after we finish this hearing. So um, you might browse through that if you have any questions um, at that after the we hear this bill, we can discuss that. So with that, um, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Representative Moser, thank you. Second. Representative McNaughton, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. I believe that's the first time that I've ever done that without Connie prompting me. So I'm learning. Very good. With that, we'll open the hearing on House Bill 2809. Mike? Mike Heim with the Reviser Statutes Office. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, House Bill 2809 would establish a, um, a Every Mom Matters Act. Uh, Section 1 declares uh, the name of the act and also what the purpose is to give pregnant women and parents access to support services and resources to promote healthy pregnancies and childbirth, provide information on adoption, and so on. Uh, section two is a definition section. Uh, it includes um, section three uh, establishes uh, that the Secretary of Health and Environment uh, shall administer the program and the services are listed in section three. There's 11 different support services, uh, including assistance and assessing and evaluating the needs of the a participant providing uh, medical accurate pregnancy related information, uh, assistance in attaining uh, medical coverage, uh, information on adoption, and so forth. The uh, duties uh, uh, in subsection C, the state treasurer is given the responsibility to enter into agreements with one or more eligible contractors to provide support services. Uh, the uh, subsection D provides who can be a contractor um, and so on. Section 4 of the bill uh, provides that uh, in order to be eligible, a person has to be a resident of the state and a biological parent of an unborn child, an adoptive parent of a child under one year of age, or a parent of a person who is under 18 years of age and a biological parent of an unborn child. Um, the services, uh, in terms of how long they will last, is uh, listed in subsection B on page three of the bill. Two years if the pregnancy-related participant uh, results in a live birth. Six months if there's a miscarriage or stillbirth. And 15 days 
uh, if the um, uh, pregnancy ends and the termination of the pregnancy uh, induced and so on. The contractor duties are listed in section five, um, the uh, required to make a report and so on. The state treasurer duties in terms of distributing money are in section six. Uh, section seven provides that uh, no participant eligible contractor uh, shall forfeit or otherwise be required to waive a, a right to a freedom of religion or um, have, if they have a con uh, conscientious objection. Uh, section 8 um, provides uh, basically a severability clause. If you've got questions, I'll try and answer them. Committee questions? Representative Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on page four, lines seven through 12, we're seeing the expenses um, that a contractor can use the state funds for. But I just want to clarify, there's no um, like percentage or anything associated with any of these funds. So one of a one of the facilities could use 100 percent of the state resources for marketing expenses. Uh, there is no percentage, but I assume that could be handled by rules and regs in terms of what what I can't imagine is possible, though, I guess, without listing the percentage. But uh, OK, but there could be potentially some some further regulations on how that money is, is spent once those taxpayer dollars are appropriated through a program. I like assume this. the straight treasurer would provide requirements and so on. Uh, maybe it needs a rules and regulations provision. Thank you. Representative Haswood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mike. Um, so for the definition on page one for abortion provider, does that mean all kinds of abortions, even stillbirth? Uh, I'm sorry, would you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, so for abortion provider definition on line 20, page one, um, does that mean all different types of abortion, such as a miscarriage or stillbirth? Uh, other than what the language is, I'm not, uh, it basically means who performs the abortion receives money from the performance of abortion, advertises, makes referrals and so on, or operates a facility. So, um, Okay, and I have another one if I can, Mr. Chair. Um, medically accurate, I think it's first pops up on page one, line 34. Who determines what is medically accurate? Uh, I, <laughs> good question. I guess it's in the eyes of the beholder. Um, there's a lot of uh, dispute about what's medically accurate anymore in lots of areas, so I'm not sure I can answer that. Okay, and one more if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, so on page four, um, line 28 to 31, what talks about um, shall be construed to prohibit restrictions, otherwise I'm in the contractor. Um, other religious or secretarian services or programs. So does that mean that um, a religious or whoever get, is the one chosen nonprofit can combine, um, I guess, religious contributions along with the state uh, contract monies. And that could be combined. So state fundings can be used for religious activities in combination with um, other private donations or grants. Well, I, I don't would not understand it to be able to use this program to fund religious activities, but if, that, if that's your question. Okay, thank you. Committee, further questions? Representative Highbarger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mike, I have a question about uh, Section 4 and the uh, eligibility requirements um, starting on Starting on line uh, 39, page two, and going on to page three, uh, under uh, section A1, I mean, I'm sorry, 2A, a person is eligible if they're a, the biological parent of an unborn child. And then under section C, a person is eligible if they're a parent of a person who is under 18 years of age. 
and the biological parent of an unborn child. I don't, the way it's worded, section C seems redundant to me because anybody who qualified under 2A would also qualify under 2C. Am I missing something? Uh, if you could speak up a little louder, I'd probably <laughs> better answer your question. We don't have a long enough cord on the mic is the problem. Um, we're looking at uh, section four, starts on page, line 39, page two. Uh, has el I'm talking about eligibility requirements. Under section 2A, starting at line 42, uh, you're eligible if you're, the, if you're the biological parent of an unborn child. And going down to section C on um, line one of page three, you're also eligible if you're the parent of a person who is under 18 years of age and the biological parent of an unborn child. The way I read this, you qualify under 2A. You would also qualify under 2C. And I, so 2C looks redundant to me. Am I well, missing? Maybe the yeah. language is not as clear as it could be, but the way I read C, which I think is what your question is, if you're a parent, you have a child that's under 18 that is the parent of the unborn child, then that would uh, be gotcha. the okay. qualification. Thank you. Now I understand it. Any further questions of the reviser? Representative McNorton. Committee, further questions? Seeing none, thank you, Mike. Okay, next we will uh, we will call proponents. The first one is Jeannie Godwin, um, Kansas for Life. Jeannie, welcome to committee. Is that got it? <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Carpenter, members of the committee. I'm Jean Gowden, Director of Government Relations with Kansans for Life, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of House Bill 2809, Every Mom Matters Act, also known as EMMA. Um, KFL's statewide leadership is very, excuse me, statewide membership uh, is strongly supportive of legislative efforts that enact life-affirming policies to show true compassion and care for pregnant women and families who are in difficult circumstances. Um, and as was already explained to you, the program gives pregnant women and families looking to adopt easier access to a wide variety of support services. Um, we know that one of the challenges of connecting pregnant women and families to the support services that they need is a lack of knowledge of the available resources. And so the EMMA hotline is a valuable tool to help increase awareness and will also expedite the process of bringing services to those in need. Um, and I just want to highlight that, for example, when Kansans are in crisis right now or they're trying to make important life-changing decisions, hotlines offer access to timely help. For example, um, the legislature enacted the 988 uh, hotline to be able to help those who are in mental health crises. Um, there's also things such as dial a nurse. I remember when my kids were younger calling up when I had a question um, about something that was happening with one of my children. So that's just an excellent way for um, resources that are available to people who may not know that they're out there to be able to have easy access. And we encourage the committee to support 2809 and pass it out favorably, and I'll stand for questions. Committee questions? Representative Haswood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I saw that this uh, similar legislation has been passed in Arkansas, Texas, and maybe Tennessee. Is there any data on that this program has been effective? Um, I'm sure those states do report, which is also something that's in the bill, is that there will be reporting every month um, to the KDHE, and there also is every six months there will be reporting by the programs to the KDHE secretary. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Committee, further questions? Representative Highbarger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll lean over to the mic so you can hear me. Uh, in Section 7, um, uh, I'm looking at, I think we're on page, it's line 20, 
uh, I'm not sure what page it is, just a second here. Um, well, anyway, section seven. Uh, in section two of that bill on line 26, on whatever page this is, uh, it says that um, uh, the uh, contract shall not be conditioned for a, a provider. Uh, the contract shall not be required to take any action to which such contractor or employee or agent thereof has a conscientious objection. I mean, do you know of any other provision in the state statute where uh, a provider may opt out of contract requirements because of a conscientious objection? I'm sorry, I do not know the answer to that question, Representative. Okay, thank you. Do you further questions? Very good, thank you. Thank you. Brittany Jones, Kansas Family Policy Alliance. Brittany, welcome to committee. Brittany Jones with Kansas Family Voice. Um, I'm here to testify in support of HB 2809. Uh, too many bill numbers in my head. I'm going to get them confused if I'm not careful. Um, but we believe strongly uh, that providing moms and families assistance as they go through this important process of uh, deciding to raise children and br bring children into the world. They deserve every support that they possibly, that we can possibly provide them. Uh, we know that in Kansas, we are already dealing with a population problem um, as well as a foster care and adoption problem. Um, and so the Emma Act, the Every Mom Matters Act is a wonderful solution or a wonderful part of a solution to some of those problems. Um, the Every Mom Matter Act requires uh, that the contracting agencies or the contracting nonprofits uh, provide certain things to families, like ensuring they understand healthy pregnancies, uh, understanding how uh, to make healthy decisions uh, throughout their life uh, to provide the best support they can for their child, as well as providing them parenting support and other health care services. It's, uh, there are a lot of organizations already in our state that connect moms and families with these sort of resources, and this hotline can become a greater uh, a greater support to these organizations and to families throughout our state uh, by bringing all of these groups together to help these moms and these families. Um, so we strongly believe that HB 20, 2809 uh, should be passed by this body. Uh, I would like to address a question that's been asked about um, whether a miscarriage is an abortion. Uh, last session, we passed a law to re-clarify uh, that an abortion in Kansas is not a miscarriage, it's not an ectopic pregnancy. Um, it, those, those things do not qualify legally or medically as an abortion in the state of Kansas. And so that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, the Every Moms Matter Act would be, be available to moms who miscarry to provide them support and counseling um, as they go through that very difficult and hard uh, process. So um, I strongly ask that you so, uh, pass HB 28 09 out favorably when the time comes, and I stand for questions at the appropriate time. Committee questions. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Is there a marketing plan for advertising the hotline? And if so, what are some of the details? Uh, there's not a plan outlined in the bill that would be part of the RFP process um, that any potential nonprofit uh, would go through through the treasurer's office as well as KDHE. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Haskins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have uh, two questions. Thank you for your testimony. And um, I'm, I'm reading all this. I'm still trying to, what, what's the need that we're trying to solve here? So the need is to connect moms and families with information about what resources they may have access to, um, such as, you know, state resources, as well as providing them with other benefits that might be happening in their local area. Uh, we especially see in rural areas that you have some some families are having trouble, you know, accessing certain care. Um, and so this hotline can help them access care across the state. So, so on the conclusion of that, that you get into the why, what, what data, what, what information, you say some families and uh, what, I'm trying to find out the, the reason for this bill. I, as multiple, I guess the conferee previously has stated and as well as I stated, um, we have seen issues with, uh, well, we've seen the need to get more care to more families. Um, there, there are more moms, more families that are having, that need information, um, and so this is one way to provide them information. And one last question, Mr. Chair, if I may. 
And that is, I see that you're asking for reports every six months. What are the benchmarks that have been established or do you believe is important in order to say that you are meeting the needs of this? What, what are you trying to, to find with this money? The, the way that the hotline is intended to act is to help more families uh, carry healthy pregnancies to term, as well as to help them uh, process any potential pregnancy losses and help with adoption as well. Um, so some of those benchmarks could be worked out through the RFP process. Representative Haswood. Thank you. Um, so how does this compare to HB 2789, the Pregnancy Compassion Program we heard in Health and Human Services? Sure. Um, I'm not aware of all the details of that bill, um, but, and I, I know, um, and I'm not sure exactly how that bill is moving forward in the process, but um, that is the Pregnancy Compassion Act, I think, believe. Um, it, it is mainly focusing on marketing and is slightly, it is different than this bill, which is providing a specific hotline. Um, to provide, mother, to connect mothers and families with resources. So we already have the Kansas Pregnancy S Centers, um, the one that the state treasurer went into agreement already from a bill last year. Um, would that organization be eligible for other types of these types of programs? Um, I see this bill has a fiscal note of 5.8 million. Um, and the Pregnancy Compassion Care had a fiscal note of $4 million. Um, so would they be able to kind of apply an add-on to be the one component, or would these be new organizations? Uh, so I don't want to comment on the fiscal note. I might have some disagreements on the fiscal note, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but any organization that met the requirements listed in the bill could apply. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they would get that RFP, but they could apply if Okay, um, and one more, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, so, I mean, we've heard different types of this types of legislation in the Capitol. Um, we have services that already provide this types of services to um, pregnant patients, um, such as local health departments and doulas and whatnot. Why are we not funding those already exist existing systems and creating a whole new system? Yeah, so I can't comment on the funding for those other systems as do you, and I, I believe most of them are funded, um, but I can't comment on those, the broader funding there. Uh, but what I can comment is, is this helps bring some of those resources together to connect women with and families with those resources that are already existing. Okay, I would disagree because what we currently have from the bill last year, they're not including of all available resources that are available to Kansas. So I think this creates another bias system. Thank you. Representative Clayton. Okay, very good. Thank you. Committee, further questions? Seeing that, very good. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you so much. Here. Next, we have Ruth Tisdale, advice and aid. Ruth, welcome to committee. Thank you, Chairman and everybody else that's here today. My name is Ruth Tisdale. I am executive director of a pregnancy center in Overland Park called Advice and Aid Pregnancy Center. And I am here in support of Bill 2809, better known as the Every Mom Matters Act. When I was a younger mom, I'm still a mom, and new to the area, I remember calling the Advent Health nurse line because my children were sick at different times. I wasn't as connected to people, to our doctor here in the area. And I remember there were times when I had questions about how much, you know, whether I needed to take the child right away, how many um, teaspoons of Tylenol I was supposed to give my child, etc. cetera. Um, and I had come across the Ask a Nurse phone number. I remember calling that phone number on multiple occasions and having the opportunity to talk to a health professional and, and, and get some answers to my questions. There were times that they said, yes, we need to go. There were times that they said, it's on two teaspoons, whatever it was. I also remember one time when I personally was dealing with a health concern 
on a Sunday afternoon. And I did not have a doctor at that time to call because it was after hours. And I called this hotline, the Advent Health, and also they answered my questions. So why, why do I bring that up? Because information is of great value. Education is of great value. And we have access to multiple uh, sources of information through the internet, don't we? And a lot of times people get information on the internet that is not necessarily the best information for them. There are many women out there um, who sometimes are even in the moments in the, in the process of having their own abortion at home. And they need to call somebody. Not only that, um, I know that accurate education is important, especially when you're making a life altering decision. And parenting is a life altering decision. The Every Mother Matters Act would allow the state of Kansas to have a hotline throughout our state, telehealth, which has become very popular since 2020, especially for women who are facing unplanned pregnancy or women who are dealing with a little child or are in a situation, uh, miscarriage, like we talked about earlier, to have somebody they can call that can provide medically accurate information to her, or in addition, resources to other organizations that may benefit them in this process, in this situation that they find themselves. Now, I work at a pregnancy center that has a hotline that we had the opportunity to answer that call. I come from the Kansas City Metro where there are other resources available to these women. However, not everybody in the state of Kansas has access to a number that they can call that can connect them to other agencies in their time of need. Advice and Aid alone last year answered over 1,000 calls. Now, there's a lot of other women out there in Kansas that perhaps did not have a chance to call a number and get some help. And just to let you know a little bit about how that works, for example, one young woman called our office recently wanting to abort her baby because of two major stressors in her life. In the process, we were able to encourage her to come through our office to get further information about the state of her pregnancy because she was so early. And we don't charge for our services, as many of you know, pregnancy centers don't charge. While she was there, her partner also came and he had the opportunity to meet with a man to, who answered his struggles. While they were there, our social worker was able to address two of those major concerns that was leading them to this altering life decision. By the end of their appointment, they left equipped and empowered, knowing that there was an organization who was gonna walk with them through this pregnancy. Now, their situation may have ended a different way, but we were there to give them the information they needed to be make the best decision they could make for themselves and their child. So at the end of the day, we're talking about real people that need real help at a real moment of crisis. And so it is my hope that you consider and you pass the Every Mother Matters Act to help women in our state flourish as mothers and other adoption process or other ways. Thank you, and I will answer questions as needed or as you want. Very good, thank you. Committee questions? Rev. Bueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ruth. So the heart of this bill is a hotline, and you've referenced the hotline that, that you run. Yes. So I'm, I'm curious uh, if you could 
do some sort of a, a summary, the uh, maybe a, a demographic sum, summary of the the type of people that call in. Um, is there are various backgrounds, etc. Um, if we're tr- if we're going to do something similar in the state of Kansas, is there, is there anything that we can learn from the clients that you serve uh, that would that would be beneficial with the outcome of this bill? Yes, sir. In my testimony, I explained a little bit of other types of calls that we get. Um, you know, it could be calls regarding um, how do you get Medicaid or something like that. How do I apply for that process? Sometimes it's our women who are pregnant and don't have a doctor, don't have insurance or can't care. Um, so how to connect them to an organization that can provide continuous care uh, for their pregnancy. Sometimes our legal issues, concerns about paternity, concerns about the partner, um, yeah, and other things, legal matters, even even women who are not from this country sometimes call us and are trying to figure out, they find themselves in an unplanned pregnancy, how do they handle that in the United States and Kansas? And so we're able to either help them inside or send them to other organizations in our community that offer those services. We have um, women who call with Um, domestic abuse and we our social workers sometimes are able to work with them or refer them to places like safe home or other places like that sometimes it's just somebody needs a food pantry thing and we're able to channel those out any further questions seeing none thank you very much for being here thank you next we have lucretia noel kansas catholic conference Lucretia, welcome to committee. Good morning. Oh, can everybody hear me? Okay, perfect. Okay, good morning, Chair Carpenter and members of the committee. I'm Lucretia Nold with the Kansas Catholic Conference. I represent the Catholic Bishops of Kansas. And thank you for the opportunity to provide support for HB 2809. Um, I think... Anyone in this room who has either been pregnant or been um, around family and friends who um, are pregnant or just wanting to grow their family knows that there's a lot of unknowns, um, which means uh, there's a lot of questions. Um, Questions range from where can I get uh, medical care? Who can assist with my financial cost? How does the adoption process work? Or where can I get postpartum counseling? And just from my own personal experience, I know that um, my cousin, when her and her husband decided to grow their family through adoption, they had many questions. They were struggling to navigate the system. And um, thankfully, their parish priest was able to help get them connected with the resources that they needed to then go on and have a successful adoption. But I understand that not everybody has a parish priest or somebody who has those resources available for them. Or most recently, I was out in Dodge City um, at an event, and at the event, I had a couple come up to me expressing their um, willingness and openness to adopt. They had a daughter, and their little daughter was now wanting a little little brother or sister, and they felt the best way um, to accomplish that was through adoption, but they didn't know how to even get started or where to go. They came to me asking me, and I will be honest, even I... um, was a little stumped as to where to send them, especially out in Western Kansas. Um, Thankfully, um, the lady right next to me um, knew of a reference there out in Dodge City and covering the Dodge City area. So she was able to at least get them the name um, and the phone number of the location that um, this family and couple could call. But I think overall, this just kind of shows that there's a lack of resources out there and a hotline such as um, this one that is here in the bill could be very, very, very beneficial to Kansas families who have questions um, when it comes to growing their family. So I ask that we help um, provide these resources to Kansas families so they can have their questions answered and help grow their families in a healthy and safe environment here in Kansas. So um, we support HB 2809 and I stand for questions at the appropriate time. Very good. Thank you. Committee questions. Representative Clayton. 
Thank you. Uh, yes. So now I have a question. I First of all, I want to start off by expressing my gratitude to you and to the Catholic Church in general. I think that, you know, and maybe I'm biased here, but I think that at least you and I can agree that the Catholic Church has a history centuries old of doing adoption right. It's basically the gold standard. You guys know what you're doing. Thank you. You're welcome. And so here's the big question that I have is that, you know, I know that the legislator that brought this is from a rural area. I'm from the Kansas City area. So resources abound. Um, are there, are you all having trouble in uh, different dioceses? I don't know, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know the uh, correct plural of diocese. But so are there some dioceses where you're having more trouble connecting people, uh, such as the one that serves Dodge City? Because I kind of feel like the Kansas City one is doing great. Yeah. Um, thank you, Representative, for your question and for your compliment. Um, we, I don't 100% know. I know, obviously, Dodge City area is a rural area, and so they happen to only have one resource, and it happened to be the Dodge City Catholic Charities who was able to provide the resource for adoption that this couple was asking for that I referenced in my testimony. My um, cousin, her and her spouse are actually here in the Kansas City, the Archdiocese of Kansas City, Kansas. So you would think there would be um, a plethora of resources for them and even they were struggling um, to find resources and to at least properly navigate the adoption process. All right. Well. I do have some concerns. One of the things that's giving me pause here is the fact that we are looking at establishing four FTEs, so full, four full-time positions, when I think that the Catholic Church is doing an amazing job. It's a little concerning to me to see you all coming here and to find out that this isn't something that the church is able to manage. It's going to give me cause to do some more research on my own, but I'm sorry that you're struggling and I've got major concerns about how things are if this is something that the church is no longer able to do, if this is something that the state has to take over. So I'll just look into that. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. Um, thank you. And can I just make a really quick address to that? I'm not necessarily sure that the Catholic Church is struggling on helping with the adoption process. I think the struggle is Kansans in general are don't know that the resources are available to them. And so a hotline, they might not know that Catholic Charities is out there. And so having a hotline could um, could point them in that direction for help. So hopefully that, that helps. But a state-funded hotline. Okay. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for your testimony. Can you give me any idea what percentage of people would like to adopt, but for whatever reason are unable to? I do not have those numbers in front of me, Representative, but I'm happy to um, look and get them for you, or maybe one of the other conferees might have them available. But is it a problem at all that you're aware of, or does that just pretty much everybody who wants to adopt is able to? I think that there's several factors that go into wanting to adopt that are prohibiting people, maybe resources, lots of times financial reasons, um, but I'm happy to dig more into that for you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee, further questions? Seeing none, very good. Thank you, Lucretia. Thank you. Okay, next we have opponents, Taylor Morton, <laughs> Planned Parenthood, Great Plains. Taylor, welcome to committee, no stranger to committee. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. Um, as you said, I'm no stranger to this committee. My name is Taylor Morton. I'm the Kansas Lobbyist and Policy Analyst at Planned Parenthood Great Plains Votes, which is the political and advocacy arm of Planned Parenthood Great Plains. And PPGP offers uh, comprehensive, expert, and judgment-free sexual and reproductive health care to patients with three health centers located in Kansas. I'm um, here today uh, to voice opposition to House Bill 2809. This bill would, you know, as has already been said, establish the Every Mom Matters program through the Department of Health and Environment and require the state treasurer to contract with eligible organizations with the goal of providing information and support to pregnant people and parents considering adoption. 
However, organizations that provide abortion care or are an affiliate um, of an abortion provider are not considered eligible under the parameters of House Bill 2809. Uh, based on the requirements outlined in this bill, um, organizations known as crisis pregnancy centers um, or CPCs would primarily qualify as eligible organizations. These are nonprofit organizations that present themselves as healthcare clinics, but ultimately seek to dissuade pregnant people from seeking abortion care. Um, Excluding abortion providers and organizations affiliated with those that provide abortion, um, it demonstrates the what could be seen as the true intent of this bill, which is to limit and restrict abortion in Kansas, despite the broad public support for abortion access in our state. Uh, abortion is a critical component of maternal health, and in fact, most patients seeking abortion care in Kansas are parent already to at least one child. Um, staff at PPGP health centers provide education, counseling, and comprehensive resources on all pregnancy outcomes, including abortion, parenting, and adoption uh, to all of our pregnant patients. Uh, the only reason that a PPGP clinic would not be considered an eligible organization under this bill is that PPGP provides abortion care. This bill also includes provisions for assistance in applying for benefit programs um, and assistance in obtaining support if a pregnant person is a survivor of abuse or sexual assault. Abortion providers and medical staff at facilities like PPGP are also mandated reporters who are very well equipped to contact the proper authorities and help patients who may be survivors of abuse and assault. Um, Kansas is facing a very serious maternal health crisis, and the legislature is equipped to act on the issues that pregnant Kansans face, and that includes domestic violence, abuse, financial barriers, and increasing access to contraception, just to name a few. Uh, pregnant and parenting Kansans, like I said, do need real support, but House Bill 2809 is just not an effective means of accomplishing this. This bill excludes abortion providers and organizations affiliated with abortion care, um, even though abortion is a crucial piece of reproductive health and reproductive health care. Um, the Kansas legislature needs to ensure that government funding goes to legitimate health care organizations um, that provide and promote the full range of comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care. Instead of passing bills like House Bill 2809, the legislature should focus on allocating resources to addressing problems with our adoption and foster care system. You know, some of these concerns have already been raised. In addition to improving social safety net programs like SNAP, WIC, and TANF, so that pregnant people who want to become parents um, can do so without financial strain that can often make this decision feel impossible. Pregnant Kansans should feel that all options are available to them so that they can make the best decision and the decision that is right for them and their families. Uh, so with that, I do respectfully and strongly urge the committee to vote against House Bill 2809. Thank you. I'll stand for questions when Thank you. Committee questions. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Planned Parenthood does counseling that may result in not having an abortion? Yeah, the education and counseling is a very critical component of all appointments made. And I linked in my written testimony some just some of the resources we provide. So do you have any idea what percentage of pregnant women that come to Planned Parenthood leave with uh, out having an abortion or attempting to have an abortion? Uh, I don't have that data with me, but I would be happy to follow up with that. That's yeah, I'd be I very access. interested in that. Yeah. And finally, my last question would be, like I asked the previous conferee, do you know how big of a problem adopting is or is it a problem or most couples or whoever that are wanting to adopt able to adopt in Kansas or is it is it an issue? Um, yeah, and I did mention briefly and I would be happy to follow up with more thorough and comprehensive resources than what I'm able to give now. Um, but just, you know, there being so very many hoops and barriers to jump through in the adoption process, I know that's a piece that can be very expensive. Um, but like I said, I will follow up with more uh, thorough information about that. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Clayton. Thank you. And thank you for being here today. So I have a question because I think, you know, getting to the heart of this bill is the real crux here is getting information to people. So how do people find out about Planned Parenthood? Do they find out in 2024 from a hotline or are there perhaps other ways that people are able to find out about you? Yeah, I, I can't say with certainty I can follow up, but I'm fairly sure the internet or, you know, word of mouth from other patients. But um, I would say it's not 
primarily from a hotline, but I can I can find out. All right. And thank you for being here. And thank you for not asking for taxpayer money to do your advertising for you. Representative Blue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> so I'm coming from somebody who struggled getting pregnant and almost had to do IVF and so forth. And we know that the um, <clears throat> that the birth rate is down in Kansas, across the nation, so forth. Um, my question is, we know that abortions are rising. We know that Kansas is a destination state for abortions due to the, fun due to the numbers that are coming in from kdh &E. My question has to deal with, do you think that your, when I were to come into your facility, are you going to tell me that there are other options besides abortion? Because it really seems like Planned Parenthood, all they care about is aborting kids. Um, I'm confident that the education and counseling that we provide all patients is very thorough and comprehensive. And I did link in my written testimony just a couple of publicly available resources as well about parenting and adoption that are, I mean, so thorough that it took me, a, even me, a very long time to read through all of it, you know, addressing not just the, you know, logistical and pragmatic, you know, what are your, what this option might look like, but, you know, addressing some of the emotional components as well. Well, I, I just want to say a follow up to what your response is to what Representative Sanders said on your data on um, the amount of patients that come in that actually don't get an abortion and do follow through with uh, adoption, because especially in Western Kansas, it's really hard to find um, uh, avenues and, and, and hopefully resources for families that do want to adopt, especially we want to say, too, that the birth rate is is very low in Kansas. Thank you. Committee, I'll remind you that this bill is not about abortion and it's about every mom matters. So with that, Representative Howe. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just was wondering if you could tell me uh, when you get a phone call for someone that needs a resource and they are from outside of where you have a clinic, for example, um, do you guys help connect them to services within their community? Uh, how do you do that? And do you also, uh, does Planned Parenthood offer to pay for services such as pregnancy or miscarriages or bills that would be connected with that? Um, I can find more precise information about that, but I do know we, we do take the patient's location into consideration, um, of course, in connecting them with services so I can follow up and provide more thorough information about that. Committee, further questions? Seeing none, thank you for being here. Next, we have Zach Grindrich Gaylor. Zach Webex, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. Very good. Thank Welcome very to committee. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, and I'm not entirely sure how to turn my video on here, so I'll just let it ride. Um, uh, thank you to the chair and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to present testimony this morning on HB 2809. Uh, my name is Zach Gingrich Gaylord. I am the communications director at the Trust Women Foundation. We are a healthcare provider uh, in Kansas and Oklahoma with a mission to provide and protect access to abortion care for our communities. We offer comprehensive reproductive health care as well as gender affirming care, HIV treatment, Hep C testing and treatment, and other sexual health services. Uh, we stand in strong opposition to House Bill 2809. We're deeply concerned with the bill's unnecessary and almost certain squandering of resources that could otherwise support existing state programs that directly benefit struggling families. Uh, this bill, the Every Mom Matters Act, uh, is by our count at least the third bill introduced in the legislature this year that creates a channel for state taxpayer funds to be diverted into anti-abortion organizations, including crisis pregnancy centers and anti-abortion marketing firms. Uh, according to the fiscal note attached to this bill, the cost of taxpayers would exceed $12 million for the first two years alone. Uh, this type of legislation makes it seem as though the state is short on public health programming that supports pregnant people and new parents. But in fact, there are already several existing opportunities for Kansas families to engage with and improve their pregnancy outcomes, as well as anti-abortion pregnancy resource programs, uh, one of which has, ex has existed for 25 years with a mandate strikingly similar to HB 2809 and others. Uh, that program, Stan Clark Pregnancy Maintenance Initiative Program, has already been mentioned, um, been running since 1999, um, and uh, over the past three years has averaged fewer than 800 participants each year. 
uh, for context, uh, Kansas has seen over 12,000 patients due to regional abortion bans in 2022 alone. Uh, like the PMI program, uh, HB 2809 uh, mirrors already existing uh, structures and tense the names of uh, state programs and private community and reproductive health care programs, including the work of Planned Parenthood, Trust Women, also uh, local uh, and regional doula organizations, state and federal programs like WIC and SNAP, uh, community work of Kansas Birth Equity Network, Kansas Birth Justice, sorry, the Kansas Birth Justice Society, uh, and many other independent healthcare providers. Uh, it's important to reiterate that legislation like this is a dangerously poor substitute for real and comprehensive healthcare access. Kansans deserve to have properly funded already existing programs to improve their effectiveness and outcomes. Uh, the Becoming a Mom Pregnancy Support Program was created in 2010 in partnership with March of Dimes. Uh, this is another program that through cognitive behavioral curriculum seeks to lower preterm births and increase healthy pregnancy outcomes. Uh, tellingly, after nearly 15 years in existence, the Becoming a Mom program is still only implemented in fewer than a quarter of all Kansas counties. Yet in those counties, the program has reported significant impact in reducing infant mortality rates. Uh, this is a program of proven and reported results, uh, yet we've not seen legislation that's interested in increasing support or starting a hotline for this uh, program as well. Uh, if, if the sponsors of this bill wish to improve health outcomes for pregnant people and their families, there's no sound reason to exclude community health clinics, uh, doulas, primary care physicians, or even most OBGYNs from the support granted in 2809. Exclusion of such facilities and providers suggests the authors of this bill don't want pregnant people to have access to all choices, information, or resources, just those that support their own personal aversions to abortions. Uh, this bill ignores a clear and important fact that abortion providers and medical professionals who correctly view abortions as an integrated and essential part of reproductive health care are far better positioned to point people to essential resources, even when abortions are not part of that patient's care plan. We see more people, we do more community work, and we're more trusted by our community partners to support positive health outcomes. And we can make these commitments without receiving state funding directly or through tax subsidies. So rather than continue to pass anti-abortion agendas by any means necessary, we support the legislator bringing attention and resources to programs that directly benefit our communities, such as expanding Medicaid. When people have access to health care on their own terms, without coercion, they make the right decisions for themselves and their families. Support community birthing centers. Remove barriers to contraception access, including emergency contraception. Support expanded access to doula and midwifery care by integrating midwives into maternity care and removing restrictive laws and regulations and advocate for equitable maternal health care that ensures pregnant people can give birth in a supportive environment and help health coverage to ensure they can afford their care. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to testify against HB 2809 and I'll uh, stand for questions at the appropriate time. Committee questions. Seeing none, very good. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, committee, I'll bring your attention to written opponents or Laurel Birchfield, Melissa, I don't know how to pronounce that name in Sapphire. Okay, with that, we'll close the hearing on uh, 2809 and we will open the hearing on 2813. Mike. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, House Bill 2813 would create a uh, new crime of coercion to obtain an abortion. It would be defined as engaging in coercion with knowledge that a woman is pregnant and with the intent to compel the woman to obtain an abortion when the woman has expressed desire to not obtain an abortion. Uh, the penalty is uh, listed in subsection B of uh, section one, a person felony uh, is what it would be and shall be sentenced to not less than 30 days, no more than one year imprisonment and fine not less than 500, no more than $5,000 or if it's committed by the father or putative father uh, who's um, 18 years of age or older at the time of the unborn child of a pregnant woman and the pregnant woman is less than 18 years old, then it's a 
uh, person felony, the offender would be sentenced to 90 days, no more than one year, and fined between a thousand and ten thousand um, dollars. There's also a uh, provision, uh, section two is amended dealing with the uh, sentencing guidelines and grid. And if you turn to page uh, 12 of the bill, uh, it provides that uh, if the trier of fact finds beyond a reasonable doubt that the offender committed any act described, and there's a number of statutes that are listed there in my uh, brief, I listed some of those that are, or I think all of them that are listed here. Uh, if you commit one of these crimes uh, in addition to the crime uh, listed of uh, coercing, then you would be sentenced to uh, one level higher than what the, uh, the level would be that uh, the crime that's listed. Uh, if it's a level uh, one, then you would be given a sentence of 25 years minimum. Uh, if you've got questions, I'll try and answer them. Many questions. Representative Heiberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mike. Are there any existing criminal statutes that would potentially apply to any of the conduct uh, covered in this bill? Uh, are you talking about an enhanced uh, level one uh, above? No, no. Any, any this uh, bill describes certain behaviors that it defines as criminal. Are there any existing criminal statutes that would criminalize any or all of the same behavior? Like a criminal threat statute, or well, certainly, um, I'm not sure that there is a specific crime that would apply to coercion, but uh, to obtain an abortion, I uh, you could uh, maybe get an assault or a battery type thing, uh, and so on. Uh, certainly, if you're committing uh, those one of those other crimes. Uh, in addition to uh, f trying to force someone to get an abortion, uh, then the existing crime would would apply. Is there a criminal threat statute that would apply to any of this behavior? A criminal precedent? Criminal threat? Uh, there is a provision in current law that if you commit certain offenses against a law enforcement officer, uh, this is on page 10 of the existing uh, of the bill, uh, then you would be bumped one level above what the crime would be. Committee further questions of our revisor? Representative Hassler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there kind of, is there a timeline on this? Can this be retroactive as well? Is there a what now? I'm sorry. Like a timeline. Um, maybe someone can um, say that they were coerced into an abortion um, after certain years after the abortion, or if this goes into effect, they can, um, I guess, bring that legal action. The uh, statute of limitations, I assume, would be five years, which would be for other crimes. Okay, thank you. I'll pass. I'll pass right now. Thank you. Sorry. Committee, further questions? Seeing none, Mike, thank you very much. Next, we have um, Representative Schmoy. Welcome to committee. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, committee. It's always good to join you in the morning. Um, Today we're talking about coercion. Anytime someone uses threat of violence, threat of um, harming your financial situation, threat of anything that has to do with how you function as a human being and how you go about living your life, that is wrong. We were all on the House floor last week, and everybody in this room agreed that coercion is something that needs to be addressed. 
It is something that needs to be taken seriously, and it is wrong. Coercion for abortion looks different in different situations. It can come from anywhere. It can come from a parent that says, you are my daughter and you will do as I say. I've already made the appointment and you have to go. It can come from a boyfriend that says, absolutely, you will not go through with this. You will not burden me with child support. It can come from a doctor, such in, as in my case, who for over an hour told me that I was selfish for putting my parents into a situation where they were going to watch not only the baby die, but it take me with it through internal bleeding. I was called selfish at least 10 times and then I stopped counting. I was told that my parents were going to have to pick out my casket. I was told that my parents were going to have to make all the arrangements. He asked me at one point what kind of flowers I wanted at my funeral. Not only was that doctor wrong, not only did he tell me that I had to set an appointment before I left that office and I wasn't leaving that office until I decided what day to kill my baby. Not only was he wrong about me dying, he was wrong about my baby dying. That child is now 21 years old and he is absolutely amazing. I wouldn't trade a moment of time with him. Coercion looks different, but it has the same effect. Whether it's a parent, whether it's a boyfriend, whether it's a doctor, whether it's a human trafficker who wants to make sure that your body is available for the next customer. Coercion is absolutely wrong. We all know it. We've all agreed to it. It's time to apply that in these situations. Thank you, and I will stand for questions. Committee questions. Representative Moser. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Representative Hoyt. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Agreed. Thank you for the testimony. I do have a couple questions. Um, because I, I do believe that this type of coercion is a form of domestic violence and I, I'm not I, there. I have some issues with technical problems in the bill, but overall, um, so I'll just start with the first one. So it's a more serious, uh, penalty if the father, putative father is the one who does that. But I guess my concern would go farther, um, if it is a, a spouse who and who is not the father but does not want that person to have the child um would you be opposed to including that as well coercion is coercion okay and i my I, i'm this actually may be more for the reviser um or attorney but how do we know um how is the putative father determined is it based on the the his perception of whether or not he's the father or who whose perception is that based on um, if, if they are believed to be the father and we don't know who the father is? Do we, anybody, advisor? Do you? The word putative is another word would be presumed. Uh, you can always uh, by uh, a blood test determine the paternity. Okay. I, I do think there might be some issues with that language. And then I would build on this saying, I think that reproductive coercion is a form of domestic violence. Would there be opposition? I, I think there are other ways that women can be co coerced um, into trying to force somebody to become pregnant. Uh, 
destroying contraceptives or denying access to contraceptives, um, removing condoms during sex without the partner knowing? Are there other forms of reproductive coercion that would be um, okay to combine into this? I still stand as coercion as coercion. So uh, I agree with you on all of that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee, further questions? Thank you very much, Representative. Thank you. For the next conferees, I would remind we're kind of running low on time. Jeannie, come on up. Uh, just try to make your uh, remarks, your testimony as brief as you possibly can. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Chairman Carpenter, members of the committee, Jean Gowden, Director of Government Relations, and we stand strongly um, in support, Kansans for Life does, of 2813 protection from abortion coercion. Um, abortion advocates tell the public women who get abortions do not regret them, and they cite a 2015 turnaway study. Um, but in it, for too many women, the right to choose abortion has become the duty to have an abortion for the benefit of other people. And you're going to hear from another conferee about the study that was done recently. She's one of the, the co-authors of the study of more than a thousand American women who revealed that of those women having had abortions, two thirds of them reported them as unwanted, coerced, or otherwise inconsistent with their own values and preferences. So as Representative Shmoy mentioned, that coercion can rise to the level of um, threats regarding housing or financial support, um, also possibly economic um, career or educational opportunities could be threatened. So um, HB 2813 essentially gives women who are facing coercion to have an abortion the legal backing they need and is an additional tool for prosecutors to seek justice for these women. Um, and in regard to um, abortion coercion, it could be any number of people could be coercing the woman to have an abortion, as opposed to something like the domestic violence situation, which is already being dealt with in um, uh, legally, uh, the different statutes uh, dealing with specific domestic violence um, threats, such as it would be, could be the intimate partner that is, is causing the coercion. This bill specifically addresses any number of the people who could be involved in coercing the woman to have an abortion. Um, so I just want to mention that it's happening all across the United States, including here in Kansas back in 2014, um, with the man who has since been convicted of putting um, the chemical abortion drugs in his girlfriend's pancakes in order to kill their child, which did happen. So for those who believe that abortion should be a woman's choice, I ask you to join us in support of House Bill 2813 to ensure that it truly is her choice and not someone else's. And I thank you for your consideration and it will stand for questions. Committee questions briefly. Seeing none, thank you very much thank you. for being. Next we have Brittany Jones. Welcome back. Thank you so much, um, Chairman. Brittany Jones, uh, K Director of Policy for Kansas Family Voice. I will keep my remarks brief uh, to relieve time for other conferees, but we strongly support HB 2813. We believe that women should not be coerced into abortion and that this bill will provide them or will provide them some agency as they seek to go again uh, to, to uh, bring an action against those who have abused them. Um, so I ask that at the appropriate time that you pass HB 2813 out favorably and I stand open for questions. Committee questions. Seeing none, thank, thank you very you. much for being here. Haley Thomas. Good morning and welcome to committee. Good morning. My name is Haley. I work at a better choice. It is a pregnancy center in Wichita. Um, and I am testifying in support of House Bill 2813 today on behalf of our clients who have experienced coercion in their own lives. Um, as a non-medical provider, as we've been pointed out, um, our goal is to provide a safe space for clients to share their experiences and learn about their pregnancy options. Um, so the first client that came in 
was a teenage girl who was being coerced into choosing abortion by her mother. We bring all of our clients back by themselves so that they can share their experience freely and they can establish trust with us. Um, so this client told us that she really wanted to parent this baby. She had a lot of support from her boyfriend and her boyfriend's family. Um, but her mother told her directly that she did not have the right to raise a child. Um, she told us that her mom had been verbally and physically abusive in the past, and she told us that she would force her to have an abortion, um, but she was terrified to talk to her about it. Um, so thankfully, we were able to bring mom back and talk to the daughter, um, and in this case, we had to file a DCF report and get authorities involved. But um, sometimes the people who are supposed to protect us and listen to us the most are the people who um, sadly choose to coerce women into abortions, in this case, young girls. Um, and then the next client that I had was very similar to um, the previous representative story, but she was coerced by her doctor um, to have an abortion. At least they told her that she should not leave the office before scheduling her appointment or she could die. Um, but after getting in touch with a high-risk pro-life OB, she ended up delivering a beautiful, healthy baby boy, and they're both doing great to this day. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to testify on behalf of the women we serve um, in support of House Bill 2813. Women should have the opportunity to make fully informed decisions on their pregnancy without coercion, um, and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Brief questions. Seeing none, thank you very much for being here. Next, we have Terry Hun, Project to Restore. Welcome to committee, Terry. Thank you very much, Chairman and the committee members. My name is Terry Hund, and I'm the program director for uh, Project to Restore, a long term restoration program for women recovering from commercial sex trafficking in Topeka, Kansas. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in favor of House Bill 2813. I've worked in this population for over 20 years with incarcerated women, with homeless and sex trafficked women. I've learned a great deal from them. It's an indescribable, the physical and emotional traumas experienced from childhood sexual abuse, familial trafficking, gang, pimp controlled trafficking, after using all the horrific abuse as, it means, as a means of control, coercion. When I was asked to testify, two stories immediately came to my mind. The first was a woman in her late 20s that was pregnant and had given birth to twins at 26 weeks. She was excited to be pregnant, but lost one of the children. And we talked a little bit about, as I had responded to her, for support. And she talked a little bit about, you know, having 12 pregnancies. And I'm thinking at 27 years old and 12 pregnancies, what did that mean? She began to describe that several of them were miscarriages. Her body wasn't able to carry them because of all the trafficking that she had endured. But she also said that he gave her those pills that made her expel the pregnancy. She was excited to be able to carry that one little boy, and he today is a very healthy little boy. The problem here was the traffickers. Because of the money that was involved in this, the coercion of having to do an abortion would, would uh, not benefit their profit. The second woman was forced into trafficking by a well-known businessman in her community, selling her to other well-known businessmen and wealthy businessmen. She became pregnant and was forced to have an abortion. She begged them not to have an abortion because she really wanted to be a mother. And instead, they forced her to that. They forced her to that in the coercion that she would be harmed or her family would be harmed. Today, she suffers from that, um, of not being able to be a mom. She also stated that the abortion that she had most likely made her sterile, so she would never be able to be a mom. As we all know, trafficking is a $150 billion industry in the United States. Kansas is known as a supplier state because we're really nice people, which make us very vulnerable. 
women who have suffered and endured commercial sex trafficking are some of the most broken people in our society. It takes years, a lifetime to overcome, maybe never. Forced abortions add to the devastation of the trafficking that they've endured and those who destroy the lives should be punished accordingly. I am support of House Bill 2813 and I stand for questions at the appropriate time. Very good, thank you. Committee questions. Seeing none, thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you. Lucretia, you're up again. Hello again, good morning. Um, again, I'm Lucretia Nold with the Kansas Catholic Conference where I represent the Catholic Bishops of Kansas. Um, thank you for allowing me to provide support for HB 2813. Um, just kind of really quickly, um, with coercion, you're forcing something on someone um, that they don't want and doing so is disrespectful and morally degrading. Um, this is especially truthful when um, a woman is forced and then un um, forced into an unwanted abortion. And a main area that this frequently happens is um, in the sex trafficking world, which the last conferee definitely talked upon. Um, and I wanna just highlight a little bit more about the issues of um, forced coerced abortions within the sex trafficking world. Um, this past fall, I had the honor of being at a conference and listening to a sex trafficking survivor. Um, she mentioned that her and many of the other women that were um, in the trafficking actually wanted to get pregnant because in their mind, they thought if they were pregnant, that was their way out of sex trafficking, or it would at least give them a break, especially since many of them were being sold um, a dozen plus times a day. Um, however, they were completely wrong when they found themselves pregnant, um, the traffickers only cared about one thing and that was making a profit. Um, and because of that, um, the traffickers would send the women to the abortion clinics, um, force them into having abortions so they could quickly get back on the market. Some of the women were forced back out on the market within less than 24 hours of having their abortions. Um, and the survivor who was speaking said that one of the gals that she knows was actually forced into having 17 abortions because bottom line, the traffickers only care about making a profit. These women deserve better. All women deserve better. And with that, I ask for your guys' support on um, HB 2013 and I will stand for questions. Very good, thank you very much. Committee questions. Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have opponent, Sapphire Garcia Lees, Kansas Birth Justice Society. Is she on WebEx, Lance, potentially? Okay, neutrals, Tessa. Oh, WebEx. Tess, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? There you go. There you go. Well, good morning, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Tessa Longbonds Cox. I'm a senior research associate at the Charlotte Lozier Institute. And I thank you for the opportunity to provide information today on this important matter. And I would like to draw your attention to a few key findings from a recent study I co-authored looking at the experiences of 1,000 American women, including 200 women with a history of abortion, which is similar to the, the national average. Over 60% of the women in this study who had an abortion reported feeling pressure, whether from finances, circumstances, and other people in their lives to choose abortion. And interpersonal pressure was correlated with negative emotional and mental outcomes. Almost 70% of the women did not want the abortion, including 10% who felt coerced. And 60% would have preferred to give birth if they had had more emotional support or financial security. This adds to other research, including a recent poll by the BBC that found that 15% of all women in the, Uni the United Kingdom have experienced pressure to undergo an abortion that they did not want. 
There are multiple examples of women being given abortion drugs without their knowledge or consent in order to force an abortion. I know one of those examples has already been shared today. But there was recently also the man in Texas who went to prison after repeatedly attempting to dose his pregnant ex-wife with abortion-inducing drugs. And as others have already mentioned, research shows that victims of human trafficking have frequent contact with abortion centers and are at risk of having abortions against their will. Thank you for allowing me to provide information on this important issue, and I stand for questions. Very good, thank you. Committee questions? Representative Heiberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here, Tessa. Uh, of the women in your study who said they were felt pressured to have an abortion or coerced, how many of those were felt coerced by individuals? Can you, you understand the question? Yes, that is actually something that we did not break out in the study itself, but we did some follow-up research that I would be happy to provide to you. Very good. Thank you for that. Committee, further questions? Very good. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we'll close the hearing on 28. 13 uh, committee at, at, uh, representative Thomas. Are you still on WebEx? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. A uh, web uh, representative Thomas has a bill to introduce very quickly. Yes. My apologies. I have two, four RS three, four, one, nine. It's a bill rep, uh, addressing licensure for convicted felons to operate a liquor establishment after 10 years of serving time. Committee objections. Seeing none bill is entered. Thank Committee, you. Uh, in the interest of time, I think the senators are waiting to get in here, but I did want to just kind of brief you about the bill that we may hear. It's being drafted as we speak this. Uh, it's called a hospital provider assessment. Uh, the acronyms are HCAP. We will try to hear this on um, Thursday if we can. But basically, this is the hospitals in our state tax themselves to bring down federal money. And so at this time, our uh, rate of taxation, our rate of return is 3%, and we're uh, projecting to raise that to 6%. The 3% rate brings down, the hospitals uh, will tax themselves $181 million. That brings down $497 million worth of federal funds so the net for our hospitals um, is 315 million. So if we can extrapolate that out, this would be another $300 million to go to help our rural hospitals and all of our hospitals, quite frankly. So um, that's the, the it in a nutshell. I'd be happy to answer any questions at some point in time. If you want to come by the office or have any questions, call me. Uh, but we may work that depending on how this bill that I just introduced today uh, goes through the process. So if not, it'll be next Tuesday. So no meeting tomorrow. No meeting tomorrow. 